All right, so I got the streaming going, and we can now get back into the topic. Okay, so there was one question. You know,、uh, at least one student asked me about a question about the microcode stuff. So I'm assuming that you know there are quite a few people having the same kind of question. So what I'll do today is I will、um, go back to that question and kind of quickly work out the solution again. But this time I'm gonna、uh, make the opcode. Uh, implement an opcode into the、uh, into the ROM, so we can actually test it. Okay, so that's kind of a continuation of the discussion of I think question number two, but we'll talk about it in a slight with a slightly different emphasis today. All right, so we'll go ahead and、uh, go to that question first because I personally cannot remember the question, so I'm gonna go to the share folder, you know, pick up that question again, and then we'll. I work out、uh, the answer from the test, and let's see. I think it is this question, right? Yes. Okay. So what we'll do、uh, is we're gonna work out this particular thing. Okay. Are you guys ready? Okay. Thank you. So what we'll do is I'm gonna work this work this out again, but this time I'll be going at a much faster pace compared to last time. So、um, so if you want the details or slower explanation, you might want to rewatch the video from、uh, last Wednesday. And also, you know, I sent an email to all of you already as an announcement、uh, for the second half of the practice test. You'll、so、go to the、um, Recorded video last Thursday for for the Thursday class, so you know it's kind of a combination of the Wednesday and the Thursday. So between the two videos, you will have you know all the questions covered. All right, so getting back to this one, let me、um, okay. I'm going to download it and work out work this out in、uh, Zerno again, because this way I can just mark it up and work out the、uh, the stuff. All right. I have to be careful because the cable is under tension, so you, we might lose、uh, connectivity because of that sometimes.、Uh, page width, and then we just go to question number two. All right. So when we get to question number two, we have to remember to make that correction、uh, because without making the correction, it would not be、um, possible. So we are changing the、uh, one to a zero x eight zero. Which is a bit seven, so that's the only change we need to make in order to. I mean, we have to make some corresponding changes to、uh, TB zero. You know, so it's going to be TB seven here because we are testing bit seven and not bit zero anymore. So assuming we make all those changes, you know, now the question is、um, uh, quickly to go through this process in order to、uh, come up with the、uh, the ROM content. All right. So what we know about the first one is we do not.、Um, okay, we need to bring up the、uh, logic, logic sim also, so that we can take a look at the actual circuitry. Okay. All right. So here's logic sim. <clears throat> so the one of the question that I got was, you know, how do we get started with something like this? So if once we identify that we have to first perform perform the logical and operation, we start with that. Okay, we look at the entire architecture and we ask the question: How can we perform a logical and operation? There's only one single component of the entire processor that can actually perform a logical and operation, or bitwise and I should say bitwise and operation, and that's inside the ALU. Okay, so we look into the ALU, and you say. This is what we want to do. Okay, let me highlight that. This is what we want to do. So now the question is, okay, knowing this is the actual thing that we want that we want to do, how do we configure everything else so that we can perform the operation? What are we ending with? What that becomes the next question. So according to <clears throat> the question, I think we want register A, or at least with this particular variation, we want to use register A. So what we need to do now is to say, okay, how do we route register A to this particular AND gate? So that's the next question. So we track down this wire, okay, to 
this demultiplexer. So this demultiplexer needs to be configured, or the select of this of that demultiplexer needs to be, let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So we need this particular demultiplexer. And that means all of the other de the other demultiplexer and also the multiplexer here, they all switch at the same time because their select you know, wires, they're all connected to the same thing, which we know as operation select. So that means this has to be 100, which also means the ALU needs to be enabled because if the ALU is not enabled, then all of the demultiplexers as well as the multiplexers do not do a single thing. Okay? So that answers a few questions almost right away as far as the answer of the test is concerned because now we know the ALU is enabled. Put a one here. The operation here needs to be a four. Okay, now I know four is decimal and not binary, but it's okay to fill in the table as it is right here. Um, then the next question now is what are we ending you know, with what else? Okay. We cannot use a constant. There is no way to route a constant directly to the ALU. But bit seven is special because it is also known as the sign bit, okay? And how do we know that? Because when you look into the ALU, okay? When you look into the ALU, you can see that um, the sign bit is here. It is extracted simply as bit seven of the result of the operation. What operation? It can be any of the operations. It can be an add, can be a subtract, can be a bitwise and, bitwise or, bitwise not, or a bit shift. So just end it with itself. Hmm? So all we have to do is to end it with itself, or, well, because we don't have anything else to end it with that guarantees to have the same bit as register A, right? So ending with A with A is the only way to do it. So now that means you know we can zoom back out. And then we track down input one, okay, which is you know the, the one of the inputs into the ALU, and we say we need this to connect to register A, but it connects through a demultiplexer, so that means this particular demultiplexer, which is known as, uh, or the select is known as R O zero demux, so we need that to make a route like this, and we this is one, okay, so we go back to the question. And RO0 demux needs to be a 1 at this point. Do you see how I'm answering the question like really step by step? So the first thing is to find out what active component is needed. Then the second question is how do we route the active components so that they can perform the operation together? That's basically you know, what the process that is involved. So register output 1 select is going to be a 0 because we need to use register A, which is known as register zero inside the register bank. We also need to say register output zero to be enabled because otherwise that particular, that particular D multiplexer is not going to do a single thing. Let me point out which one we are talking about here. We're talking about this particular D multiplexer. Um, it needs to be enabled by this wire. Is that okay? All right. So we go back here and we ask, okay, what else do we need to specify? We can specify register input enable to be a zero because we are not updating any registers. Now, if you say, you know, we're going to update register A with, reg with the output of the ALU, that works too. It's okay. It's not a problem because it is guaranteed to not to change, okay? But in this case, I'm only testing, so it kind of makes sense not to enable this. <clears throat> so there are two possible answers. You, know, you, can, you can specify a zero here and then an asterisk here, or you can specify a one over here, and then you specify a zero in RISEL. So both will be considered correct answers. All right, what about register output one from the register bank? So that has to do with the other input of the ALU, which is this wire here. So I need to route this wire to uh, register output one of the register bank, which is all the way over here. So now the question is, what kind of multiplexers or demultiplexers do I need to configure so that this route is completed? This is yep, so we need this wire to make the connection. So we need uh, RO1 demux to be a one. So we go back here, we need that to be a one. And we also know that we need to select register 
A as register output one of the register bank. So that means you know, we have to put a zero you know, where we specify RO1SEL. And then the other thing is this particular multiplexer. That one doesn't re really need a lot of attention because we have register output one DMUX being a one, we have ALUEM being a one. So that means the NAND output of this, which is FC, is going to be a zero. And that is used to specify input zero. So that's correct already. So we know the multiplexer is already, this particular multiplexer is automatically configured correctly simply because the ALU is enabled and also because register output one multiplexer is a one. So now we look at all the other bits, okay? Um, RAM is not involved in this process. There's no need to use RAM at all. So RAM select is a zero. So RAM load is going to be an asterisk because we don't need it. And in this particular case, because I'm not updating any register, so I would also put an asterisk here as RIMUA uh, mux because that multiplexer is not actually doing a single thing. Um, address mux is also going to be an asterisk because I'm not using RAM, so I don't really care how I route uh, to the address port of RAM because it doesn't really matter. Uh, the program uh, counter is also not being updated in this particular process, so this is going to be a zero here, which also means you know PC mux mux is automatically going to be an asterisk because if I'm not updating the program counter, uh, PC mux mux is basically ultimately used to decide how we are updating the program counter. So if the program counter is not getting updated, the value of PC mux mux is irrelevant. Are we doing okay so far with all of this? Okay. So now we go back, and there are a few. There are there are two wires that have no name. Uh, one wire is this guy over here, which is saying, do we want to reset the microcode pointer? Nah, probably not, because, you know, as soon as this flat, this bit is a one, the microcode pointer re resets to zero, which concludes the execution of this instruction. So we don't want to do it until um, the very end. And the question already said, you know, you do not have to worry about that. So we want that one to be a zero for sure. And then D24, okay, bit 24, which is this particular bit, specifies how we are updating the microcode pointer. We do update the microcode pointer on every single falling edge. The question is, how do we want to update it? We do have another slice that we need to execute, right? So we need to increment. In order to increment, we need to bring this wire all the, and use this particular input, which is input one of the multiplexer, to update the microcode pointer, which means a one for this particular wire, which is bit 24 of the output of the ROM, is the correct choice. So we go back to this table, put a one over here, and IREN is going to be a zero because we don't want to update the instruction register. Okay, the only time you want to update the instruction register is in the fetch cycle, which is uh, when the ROM is at location 000 on a rising edge. That's the only time that you want IREN to be a one. Okay, so we are obviously not doing fetch. So are we, are we okay with this slice? Yes, okay, yep, go ahead. So the asterisks are can be zero, can be whatever, which means you know, and by default I just choose zero, but they can be anything. Yep. Um, so we are now ready to move on to the second slice. The second slice is a whole lot easier because you can just copy that from the JSI instruction, because we are just doing a regular usual branch if the sign flag is a one, with an immediate to specify where we are going to. Is that okay? So. How do you figure out the bit pattern if that is what you need to specify? Well, you can copy it, but when you copy it, you have to be careful because uh, the bit pattern in JSI uh, does not tell you what is not care. Okay, It does tell you what is enabled and what is disabled, but it doesn't tell you what is not care. So you have to be a little bit careful with that particular process. So we'll go ahead and fill in the ones that we know for sure, which is you know we don't want to reset the microcode pointer, and yes, we still want to increment after this particular slice 
or particular uh, content in ROM. Okay, so that much we should that much we know. We also know that we don't want to update the instruction register, so we put a zero over there. The rest is a little bit tricky, okay, because you know we can. There are two possible outcomes because we are doing a conditional branch. So when you're doing a conditional branch, which means you know you're going to update the program counter anyway, okay, whether the sign flag is a one or not, you have to update the program counter. If the sign flag is a one, then you update the program counter using the content that the program counter itself is pointing to in RAM at this point. If the sign flag is a zero, then you just increment. You just go like, I will pretend that there's no JSI instruction here. I'm just moving forward to the next available instruction. So you, you're just incrementing. But either way, you're changing the program counter, which means P, PCEN has to be a one. All right, so PCEN is a one, but because we also know that in the case that sign flag is a one, we need to use the next location in RAM or what the program counter is pointing to right now at this point to update the program counter. That means RAM is actually being used. So RAM cell is going to be a one. Whenever RAM cell is a one, you have to ask, are we reading or writing? We are reading, so RAM load is going to be a one. Whenever you're using RAM, you also have to think about who is driving the data, I mean the address port of RAM. So I can never remember which one is which one, so I have to go back to look at the diagram. So this means you know you don't have to memorize everything. Okay, you just have to make sure that you bring your bring the schematic diagram of the processor, the ALU, and also the register bank, and you can work out the rest from that map. Okay. So I'm looking at this wire, okay, this wire that drives the address port of RAM, and it goes into this multiplexer. I need this to connect to the output of the program counter. So I need this input to connect to this output here, which means address mux needs to be a one. So I switch back here, and I put a one in address mux, okay. Um, now that I'm here, I can now say the ALU is no longer used so in this case, you know, ALU EN is going to be a zero. If the ALU is not used, I don't really care what operation I'm specifying. Um, I don't need to use any of the registers anymore. So I'm done using the register bank, which means um, register uh, and register output zero enable is going to be a zero because we are not using that register which also means the select is now a not care. The DMUX is also a not care. Uh, register output one select is a not care. Register output one DMUX. Now that one, we have to be careful because that one, that particular uh, D multiplexer does not have an enable pin. So we have to make sure that we are not routing it to something that is potentially catastrophic. So this wire does go to a input of the, um, multiplexer, but we have already selected the address mux to be one, so it doesn't really care in this case. So now we know that this can, this also can be a not care because it won't do, it won't cause any harm either way. All right, so with the input, we know that we are not updating any registers at this point. So RIEN is going to be a zero, which means we don't need to know which register we are selecting. And we don't need to know how, you know, from which wire we are using to update the register. So now the only key part left is, well, the only cell that is an empty cell right now, which is PC mux mux, which is one of the more tricky parts of the entire processor architecture because it can handle conditionals in a very kind of magical way. But there's no such thing as magic in this class. <laughs> Which means when I say something that's magical, it simply means it is implemented by logic, but in a way that is kind of strange or in a way that you do not usually expect. But it is not magic at all. Okay, so PC mux mux is this particular wire. So you can see how PC mux mux is choosing one of the inputs into this particular multiplexer, so that becomes whatever is it is selected is becoming PC mux itself. Okay. So when you look at the input of this multiplexer, um, the first five wires going from zero, uh, input zero to input four, they go to, guess what, the flex register. In other words, I'm choosing, I can choose which flag of the flex register is being used as PC mux. Okay? 
So since we're doing a conditional branch of the sign flag, it kind of makes sense that we have to pick the sign flag out of the flags register. This is the only place you can select which flag of which bit of the flags register you want to pay attention to. So if you remember, you know, the uh, bit assignment, you can just go ahead and say C, Z, S, O, L. But if you cannot remember, it's okay. Go into the schematic of the ALU. It is all spelled out in the schematic. Is that okay? All right. So since I just said, you know, C, Z, okay. So C, Z, S, O, L, sign flag is number two, is input two of this particular multiplexer. So that means PC mux mux needs to be two in this case. So I put a two here. And that concludes you know, the two slices. Yep. Is the flag register enabled in No, it doesn't have to be. Because a register being enabled means it is about to be changed. And I have no intention to change the flags register. I just need its output to make a decision. Yep. So it does so it should not be enabled. All right. So at this point, it is, I might as well you know, just go ahead and tell you the magic of how PC MUX can do a clinical conditional branch. So if you track down PC MUX, which is this guy here, you, oops, uh, okay, hopefully I didn't accidentally change something. So you can see how PC MUX is also used into this multiplexer, which is also selected based on PC MUX MUX. So this one is kind of strange because PC MUX is simply, you know, um, so this output, you know, which is dependent on the sign flag right now, would turn all of these wires either to, into a zero, which means the sign flag is a zero, or into a one if the sign flag is a one. But because it is also being selected by PC MUX MUX, so that means PC MUX and PC INC would actually be exactly the same if PC mux mux is from zero to four. Are we doing okay so far? So if the sign flag is a zero, PC mux and PC ink will both be a zero. If the sign flag is a one, then both of them will be a one. Are we good with that so far? Okay. So now remembering that, okay, you know, the sign flag and PC mux and also PC ink are going to be exactly the same. Now we go back into this mess here of how the program counter is going to be changed. So you can see how PC MUX is used here to select you know, which input to, to be used to update the program counter. If PC MUX is a, um, is a one, then it will pick this particular input. So that corresponds to the case when the sign flag is a one. So if the sign flag is one, this particular multiplexer that is feeding the input of the program counter will select input one, and that will go here, which encounters another multiplexer, right? So we have to now figure out what this multiplexer is going to select as its input. So we have PC MUX here, okay? PC MUX is going to be a one because that's going to be the same as this PC MUX. Our register open zero enable is going to be a zero because we have already decided <coughs> that we do not need to use the register bank at all. So this is going to be zero, but it is negated. So we have one, one, feeding into an AND gate. This is also going to be a one. If this is a one, then we have this input wire, input one of the multiplexer. Uh, I'll point it out in here. So we're going to select this particular input one, and guess where it's connected to? It connects to the data port of RAM. Is that okay? So this is why if the sign flag is a one, the program counter is updated based on what the program counter itself is pointing to. Is that okay? So no magic at all. What if the sign flag is a zero? If the sign flag is a zero, then uh, PC MUX is going to be a zero, which means it's going to select input zero. But at the same time, we also have PC INC being a zero but uh, address MUX is a one, so that means you know, we still have a one going into K0 or, uh, or uh, carry in into the adder, so it will still be adding one. And this is why when uh, the sign flag is a zero, um, it will actually do the auto increment of the program counter so that the next, the whatever instruction is following the JSI instruction, 
it's going to execute as the next instruction. This is how the conditional branch is implemented in the, T in the TTP. Are we okay so far? I know I kind of talk really fast, but you can pause you know, when you re-watch the video. But, that's, but you can see that there's no magic here, right? You know, everything is done by multiplexers, you know, logic gates, uh, and demultiplexers. They together, all of those things, implement the conditional uh, capability of JSI. Yes? So what's the purpose of BC ink if it matches BC mux? And I guess the real question is, what happens if it gets to bit five or six on those, on the mux mux? Well, then PC ink is guaranteed to be a one, right? And so the program counter is guaranteed to increment in those cases. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because there are cases where we just want the program counter to increment. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, just to re-clarify, that box there where the output zero of that multiplexer goes into, um, what is that component again? Say that one more time. This one? The this box. wire? No, the, the box. The box. The adder. You mean this guy? Yeah. Okay, what about it? Uh, just what was that component again? This is an adder? Uh, yeah. And, um, it's function there. It's, uh, it's just an adder. Remember, we implemented an adder ourselves, you know, the uh, carry look ahead adder that we did? So this is not unlike that one, except it's all done for you. So if you click on it, it will tell you it is, in fact, an adder. So when you go to the um, reference manual of uh, Logisim, it will tell you what those ports are for. It has got five ports. Uh, three are input, two are output ports. Yep. And we have been using the adder for a while, so it's, it's a good time to make sure that you understand what it does. Yep. Yes. Yes. So when the PC mux mux is five, six, or seven, that means you are not. It is not conditional to one of the flags in the flag register, and instead it is a constant. We are either staying at the same place, or we are moving, for, moving forward. So if you have like JMPI. Yeah. So when you have JMPI or LDI, you know those would have you know, certain constants you know to up, to update the program counter. LDI does update the program counter because after reading the immediate constant, we need to increment the program counter so that it would, it would skip the constant and get to the next opcode. JMPI obviously will have to change the program counter because you are loading whatever RAM is pointing to into the program counter. All right, so now it's time to you know, stitch everything together. You know, we are looking at these two, you know, um, columns of you know indi individual things, and we are trying to put together the actual hexadecimal representation into ROM. <clears throat> so you might think, oh, that's going to take a while. Well, actually, it's not that hard because IREN is actually bit zero, and I think everything is in the right order. Um, so if you go to okay for, to do this, I have to kind of do a little. Trick either do no, no. okay. This is microcode data, but that's coming from another tunnel. So, right here we have bit zero going to um, the IREN, which corresponds to this position, and then we have um, oops, and then we have RAM select. And RAM select is, in fact, you know, this wire. And then we have RAM load. So I think you know, everything in uh, here is in the right order. OK, so that means you just have to stitch all of these bits together. But you have to be careful about the width of each item. Are we doing OK so far with this? Yes? OK. So let's go ahead and try to do this. Okay. So I'm going to put together the first slice first. Okay. IREN is a zero. Um, RAM cell is a zero. Uh, RAM load is not care. I'll put a zero there. And then RAM, uh, RI mux is not care. I will also put a zero there. Now, this time we have to be careful because you know, RI mux can be a multi bit thing. 
So we just have to double check in the schematic and make sure that it is a single bit and not a multi-bit thing. So this is our RI mux right here. It is clearly a single bit because the multiplexer only has two inputs, which means the select is a single bit. Okay, so we are now done up to this point. Uh, now it's RIEN. RIEN is going to be a zero. Um, RI cell is not care. We can put a zero there. Now RI cell is two bits. So there will be two zeros. Okay. Um, and then RI zero EN is a one bit. It's a single bit. It is a one. So this is how we stitch all the bits together. After you stitch all the bits together, then we um, look at the entire bit pattern and convert that pattern into a hexadecimal number, which is going to take up six digits. Then we program the ROM with those six digits, and then we have you know what we need. Is that okay? So do you think I go through this process manually to come up with all of those content in ROM? I'm not. You. You have to understand that I'm actually very lazy in nature, okay? So that means, you know, when I encounter something like this, which involves a lot of chore, you know, a lot of repetition, and also a lot of, you know, way that I can make mistakes because it's all manual, I don't do it by hand. So what I do is I have, um, originally I have a spreadsheet to do this, and then the spreadsheet tool became, you know, just your know, custom C programs. So I can actually use a make program and just, you know, crank out all the code at the same time. So if you're interested in that process, um, but you can see what I'm doing, right? You know, basically, you know, you have to know what, how many bits is to each field, and then you have to shift it, you know, to the right position, and then you or all of those things together. So that's how you crank out the ROM code, you know, the, the uh, content in ROM corresponding to a particular opcode. Are we going to have to do so for the test? Hmm? Um, no, because you know this last process, this last step is only needed if you need to test whether the code, the ROM, the, the ROM code is working or not. So instead of using class time to stitch everything together, I'm just describing the process, and I can do this on my own, and then later on I can show you the result and how it works. But instead of using class time to do it, I'm going to use the you know, off class time to do this. Yep. Yes, yes. So even between an AMD versus an Intel processor, even though the instruction set is identical and you know, the opcodes are also identical, the actual underlying implementation can be entirely different. In fact, if the underlying implementation are exactly the same, one company can probably sue the other company for infringing on you know, intellectual property. So it is very likely that the Intel implementation of one single opcode is entirely different from the AMD way of implementing exactly the same opcode. Because the, the way things are interconnected between all the registers, the ALUs and whatnot, between an Intel's core versus an AMD core are probably very different. <laughs> so are we good so far with all of this stuff? Yes? Okay. All right. So with this you know, out of the way, <clears throat> I'm going to continue with uh, the main topic of the class, or are there any additional questions about the exam? Yes? Question number three? Yeah. This one? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So one, two, three. Okay, so okay, I can explain this one. Yeah, you know, but we are we're already one day behind. You know, the Tuesday Thursday class. So I'm just trying to be aware of the amount of time we have for this class. So for this question, it is a little bit different from just decoding it. So I'm giving you a bunch of bit pad. I'm giving you a 64 bit pattern represented as 16 you know hexadecimal digits. So by now you should know how to convert a 16 digit hexadecimal number into 64 bits, okay? Because you know, one digit in hexadecimal just translates into four individual bits, okay? So, but the question is not asking you what is this representing, okay? You know, you can do it that way, but you don't have to do it that way. So the question is, the task is to multiply the value being represented here 
by by this particular bad pattern, and I want to multiply. I want to multiply by ten, and then I want to figure out what is um, the uh, bit pattern representing the result of the value represented by this thing as a double times ten. That is the question. <clears throat> okay, so. If you are going to go like, okay, so I want to know the value represented by this thing, and then I multiply it by 10, and then I convert it back into a double, you can do it that way, okay? There's nothing preventing that you from doing that, but it doesn't have to be done that way. So the question is, is basically giving you a choice here and say that you can do it the way that I just described, but you can also make yourself another trick. So the other trick that we're going to use is to use a bunch of bit shift and bit or, or bit addition. Okay, so we can say five is one plus four, right? I mean, we kind of know that. But using the same way, we can also say that ten is two plus eight, right? What is so special about two and eight? Why didn't I say you know nine of uh, ten is one plus nine? Why did I? Why did you choose? What? Why? Why do you think I chose to say that ten is two plus eight? Exactly. So we can do bit shifting. <clears throat> so the trick to answer this question is you still need to know, you know, what are the bits being represented here. So you still have to know um, we have zero one zero zero as four, zero one 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 as the seven, one zero one zero as the a, zero 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 as the zero, zero 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 as the zero. Um, and then we have zero 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 one as the one, and then zero zero one zero as the two, and the rest are all zeros. Okay. Then we say, huh? There are two more zeros between the one and the two. You're correct. So we have zero 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 between those two. Okay, so now we take this and we break it up into components. This is a sign, which is for the most part not very useful. And then we have the next 11 bits being the uh, being E, but not E2. So E is really just the uh, unsigned number represented by the next 11 bits. So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So here are the 11 bits. That's our E. And then the rest are our um, fractional mantisas. So these are the fractional part of the mantisa. So now the question is, what do we do with this? Okay. So instead of you know, doing the multiplication and figuring out you know, exactly what the value is, you know, what, what is the value being represented here, we basically say you know, we have a number. The mantisa is basically one point, and then we just put a whole bunch of zeros you know, after that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oops, there's a one here. Um, and then we have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, two. And then the rest are all zeros. This is the actual mantisa. So instead of doing all the math using, you know, involving the, um, the exponent, we look at this thing here and say, we need to multiply this. We need to multiply the mantisa by two, and then add that to whatever you know uh, it is. You know when it's multiplied by eight, is that okay? But multiplication by two and multiplication by eight is simply shifting the binary point. In the case of a binary number, so what you end up with, <clears throat> so this is the the part that is that requires a little bit of care. Is you have to remember to um, you know align everything. So that this one becomes one zero, and then how many zeros are we talking about here? <laughs> um, okay, we can do this as okay. We'll, we'll just do, go ahead and count one. Okay, we got this zero already, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we got ten zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, a one followed by one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, and then one zero, blah blah. Okay, and then times eight is um, shifting it three times. 
So we have one. So basically, it is um, the number, but you, your decimal point is going to be here. Then you add all of those, and I made sure that there's no carry. So all you have to do is to look at all the ones, and then you know, put those ones into position, and that becomes the new um, the new mantissa, which is not normalized. So I'm going to finish the whole process. Okay, so we'll I'll just you know pretend that we have a dot a point here. So we have one zero 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 point, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we got the one, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten zeros. So we have the one, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten zeros. And then we have the one zero, and then the rest are zeros. So now we perform the addition, okay? It's pretty long, right? So we have one zero one zero point zero 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 one zero one zero 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 one and then zero one zero and then the rest are all zeros. So this is the new mantissa, okay? I have not adjusted a single thing about the exponent, right? Because I have only been doing all of this stuff here. I'm doing the multiplication by 10 only using the mantissa. The exponent has not been touched. Are we good so far? Okay? So you look at this mantissa and go like, well, that, that's not normalized. We, we don't like stuff that is not normalized. So what do we do? Well, we go ahead and normalize it. So you normalize it, which means you know you want to move this binary point back to here. That makes it normalized, but that means the huh? We have to increase the, to increase the uh, exponent by three. by three. Okay, so that means we look at this e here and say you know okay we need to add three to this. Okay, we'll do that later. Huh? The same. Remember, e is e2 plus 1,023. So the constant doesn't really matter, right? So if you're adding 3 to e2, you're also adding 3 to e itself. So you don't really need to know what e really is. You just add 3 to it, OK? All right, so let's go ahead and add 3 to uh, e first, OK? So we, so we are finally ready for the entire thing you know, to come together. So we, add, we have a 0 as the sign, OK? And then e plus 3, okay, so we can do this kind of in place. Uh, you're adding 1, 1 here. So this 0 becomes a 1, this 1 becomes a 0, and then we have one more here. So we end up with um, 1, 0, 1 instead of 0, 1, 0, which makes sense because 0, 1, 0 is 2, right? 1, 0, 1 is 5, 2 plus 3 is 5, okay, so that does make sense. Okay, so we just copy for the most part, you know, what um, the, the E is, which is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, and I have to be careful here because it, that this is the, these are the last three digits, which should be 1, 0, 1. So that becomes E. This is the sign. This is E. And now it's time for the rest, which is the fractional part of the mantissa. We already know after normalization, the one point is not going to be represented. So we just have to copy the rest of the bits over here. So the rest of the bits is just tedious, right? You know, so right now, we just have to say 0, 1, 0. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 0, 1. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 again. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then 1, 0, 1, 0. And then the rest are all zeros. If you get to this point, you'll get most of the credit already. Because you know, the next step to convert it into hexadecimal is just grouping the bits into groups of four from left to right. Well, technically, you should do it from right to left, but because we know there are 64 bits already, we can just do it from left to right.
So we say this is one hexadecimal digit, this is another one, this is another one, another one, okay, maybe, and another one, another one, another one, and then the rest are all zeros. So now we end up with four, seven, uh, 1101 is a D, this is a four, zero, zero, um, okay, that's, that's a, that's a one, right? And then zero, one, zero, zero is a four, zero, we have a two, and then we have eight, and then the rest are all zeros. So that's how you kind of answer this question without actually knowing what value we're dealing with. So a whole lot of bit manipulation. Are we, yep? Oh, that's just a C notation. Whenever you specify 0x in uh, C and C++, it will automatically in, interpret the rest of the digits as hexadecimal digits. Oh, okay. So yeah. not in the test? In the test, unless it is clear from the context that we're dealing with hexadecimal digits, you, know, you still should be using 0x. But if you present an answer like this, I would understand that these are hexadecimal digits and you know, it'll be fine. So is that okay? But are we convinced that this is actually 10 times you know, the, the value? You know, if in a test, you would not have a chance to do it. But you know, since we are not in a test, the way you can test whether this is actually representing 10 times the value of what it was before is to go through, through the same trick that I did in class you know, using the casting of the address and then re, uh, redoing the dereferencing. The so you can actually just enter the hexadecimal digit like before, okay? You know, understand what it is, uh, make it times ten, okay? And then you uh, reinterpret those bit pattern as in hexadecimal digits and see if we see if you get this particular bit pattern back. So that's how you can validate or verify the answer. So did I answer question number three sufficiently? Okay, all right. All right, so any other questions about the practice exam? Yep? I mean, if you have two guesses, uh, CPU and clock and drive, are those the most important two in the I do not know. So the best way is to make your own. Okay. Um, so how do you do that, like file system or something? Say that one more time. Um, OK, so there are several ways to do it if you want to generate a PDF. Uh, the first way is to actually print it, but when you print it, you don't want to print to the regular printer. You want to print to a PDF destination, and I think Windows you know, has a way to do it. Um, there are open source programs that will let you print to a PDF, you know, make a print PDF generator as a printer. So that's one way to do it. And the other way to do it is to make it export to a, P a PNG. So you can export an image into a PNG, you know, or you know, GIF. I would use PNG because it is not going to be fuzzy. If you use a JPEG, it's going to be fuzzy because JPEG is a lossy uh, compression. So I would export it to a PNG, and then once you have the PNG, then you can use whatever program you want to include it and annotate even if you want to. So I would do a PNG method um, and then import it into um, like LibreOffice Draw, you know, or uh, Google Draw, you know, online. Then you can you know, annotate and color code and you know, do whatever note you want to add to the diagram, which can help can be helpful, you know, because you can identify the active components like the, all the registers, the ALU, the RAM, and so on. So that way, you know, when you are in the test, you don't have to look for those things, you know, as tediously as anymore. You can just go like, oh, okay, RAM is over here, and you know, the registers are over here, and so on. So I, I do recommend you not to only look at the schematic, but also add your own annotation to the schematic so that by the time you're in the test, you know, you have your own notes to help you. Okay, any other questions? So just like with the first exam, you know, you can bring, you know, without any, with, within physical limit, okay, you can bring any amount of um, handwritten or printed material with you. Just no electronic other than a scientific calculator. So are we okay with that? Hmm? 
Hmm? You can have a graphing calculator as long as it is a calculator and not a cell phone pretending to be a calculator. <laughs> yep, so you can bring your uh, 84 TI, TI-84, you know, the latest and greatest if you want to. Hmm? <laughs> so any other questions about, you know, the test? You know, that's going to be next Monday. No other questions? All right, I'm so excited because we can now finally move on and talk about calling and returning, you know, and subroutines in general. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to get back to this and go back to modules. So we are basically done with um, We are basically done with um, compiling code, which is this portion here. Um, and in terms of the lab, we're going to have a new lab today. Um, and that's on stack operations. So I'm going to open up this particular lab. So what we'll do right now is to talk about uh, this particular module, which is what you need in order to kind of understand um, and be able to do the lab today. <clears throat> so this module is all about calling subroutines and returning from a subroutine. Um, and looking here, no one here seemed to have taken CISP 300 from me. Is that correct? Okay, so that means it's good in a way because no one has an unfair advantage over anybody else. Because people who took CISP 300 from me actually has an advantage because I started to talk about concepts that we'll be using in this class, even in CISP 300. I did not use the idea, I did not use the terms, you know, stack, return address, and stuff like that, but nonetheless, the concepts were there. But that's okay. Do we have an understanding of what this code in C is going to do? Okay, it doesn't do anything particularly useful main calls f okay f returns to main going to the second call call f again you know f executes there's nothing to do when it does return it returns to return zero in main and we're done right okay so that's how this program is supposed to do the question is how does it get it done okay in other words going from main to f is not a big problem we know a JMPI would do that, right? A JMPI, if you know where you're supposed to go to with a label, we don't have a problem going to, going from main to F. The problem is when F is done, how does it know where to go back to? That becomes a problem because the first time when F is done, it's supposed to go back to the second line in main for the second call of F. But the second time you call F when it's done, it's supposed to go back to return zero. So how does it know where to go back to? And the place it needs to go back to is not a constant single place. Is that, is that okay? Does everybody understand the question? So as if this is not com complicated enough, in C and C++, there's also recursion. <laughs> so in a recursion, a subroutine is calling itself several times and possibly from different spots inside the subroutine. So in that case, how does it know where to go back to? Okay, so those are the questions that we'll try to answer with this particular module. But before we try to answer those questions, we'll take a quick look at what a stack is in computer science. So in computer science, a stack is known as a LIFO, which is a last in, first out, okay? A lot of constructs in computer science are FIFO, first in, first out, like every single kind of buffer is first in, first out, okay? So when you're watching a movie, like when you're watching, when you're streaming a movie from Netflix, you don't want the Netflix you know, frames to be you know, live old because if that is the case, the, the movie will be playing backwards, okay? Which is not something, well, I suppose it can be interesting to watch, but it's not something that is intended, okay? So you want things to be FIFO when it comes to buffering. But as it turns out, LIFO is also an extremely important way of storing and retrieving items because you know, the stack is basically a LIFO, uh, 
it's a lifeful collection of things, okay? You can put things into it, you can take things out of it, but the way you put things into it and you take things out of it follows the LIFO, or last in first out principle. Yes? Is it the same stack that I would Yes. So if you have taken, you know, C, uh, CISP 430, the concept of this stack is the same as the concept of that stack, okay? But the implementation is different, okay? There's no dynamic data structure here. There's no malloc, there's no new, there's no delete. There are no pointers going from one, you know, uh, node to the next node, okay? So there is a pointer, but it's a very uh, primitive pointer in this case. So last in first out means whatever you put in last is the first thing that you take out. And in nature, or I shouldn't say in nature, but in real life, a lot of things are LIFO, even though they're not, we don't want them to be LIFO. One such thing is a refrigerator. <laughs> now, if you're, if you're one of those people who need to like, you know, buy stuff from a grocery store you know, and put things in the refrigerator, you would notice that you know, most people just put all the new things you know, at the front part of the, of the shelves, right? You know, who would, okay, who amongst you would actually take everything out of a shelf of a refrigerator, put the new stuff that you bought you know, into the deep end of that shelf and put everything back in? So there are two of you who do not use the lazy way of you know, stuffing a refrigerator. The rest of us, okay, myself included, would use a fridge as a, as a LIFO you know, structure, which means the last thing that I bought from Bel Air would be the first thing that I retrieve from the refrigerator. What about all that stuff that I bought you know, six months ago? They're at the back of the refrigerator becoming a mold farm or mold garden, depending on how you want to look at it, okay? <clears throat> Is that making any sense? Because using the LIFO way of retrieving items, unless I use up all of the items in front of the last item, you know, at the back of the refrigerator, that item doesn't get retrieved. It doesn't get used again, right? So unless, you know, there's a problem, like, you know, there's a catastrophic, you know, situation where I actually have to eat everything and eat into the back item of the refrigerator, that stuff will never get touched again. Is that okay? So does everybody understand what is LIFO, last in, first out? Yes? Okay. So knowing what is last in, first out, let's look into a way to implement it. So in this case, we're looking into um, a LIFO, and the, one, the, the unit that we want to be able to store and retrieve is just a byte. So every time when we store something, we're storing a byte. Every time we want to retrieve something, we're only retrieving a byte. Is that okay? So we are not talking about some you know, gigantic you know, data structure here. We're just talking about a byte. I want to store a byte. I want to retrieve a byte. I want to store a byte. I want to retrieve a byte. Is that okay? All right. So this declaration is what we need in order to allocate the space and also to allocate or declare a single uh, structure, a single item to keep track of the the pound defined is nothing more than just saying, okay, stack size is 32. Okay, that's all it's saying. <clears throat> um, on the next line, we declare the stack itself. That by itself is really just allocating the space for the stack, and we just we're just saying, oh, guess what? These two 30 by two bytes in RAM is the stack now. Is that okay? So, and then we have a pointer. Okay, SP is a pointer to a byte. That's basically what it is. So this is not even dealing with the initialization of the stack pointer. It's just you know, declaring the stack pointer uh, to, so that it has the correct type. Are we good with these three lines? Yes? Okay. All right. So then what do we do with you know, the, the bytes that we have allocated and what do we do with the stack pointer? So the stack pointer is interesting because the stack pointer always points to the last thing that you have put onto the stack that is still available, okay? So if the stack pointer is always pointing to the last thing that you have pushed onto the stack, this is how we push something on the stack. This is how we store something new onto the stack. It looks counterintuitive because the first thing we do is we decrement the stack pointer. This is because when the stack is empty, the stack pointer is all the way up, at a, pointing at a higher memory location 
as we use more space onto the stack, as we use more, as we store more things onto the stack, the stack point goes lower. Now, I understand this is counterintuitive, because most people say, well, why don't we count you know, from low address to high address? Why do we use up the stack from high address to low address? There are reasons to do that, okay? You know, it will become apparent later on, but right now we just have to say that, okay, an empty stack has a stack pointer pointing all the way up. As we store more items onto the stack, the stack pointer will go lower and lower. Yes? Yep, go ahead. Well, not exactly because it's an unsigned. It, it has to do with um, when you need to look at, when you need to retrieve items that you have stored like a few steps ago, uh, that offset is always positive compared to where the stack point is pointing to. That is, that's one of the major reasons. But we won't see that until much later, okay? So right now you just have to take my words for it, which is, you know, the stack, when the stack is empty, the stack point is always, you know, is pointing all the way to the point, it points past the last byte of what we have allocated. And when the stack is full, the stack pointer points to the first location that we have allocated. Okay, so you just have to take my words for it. But if that is the standard, these two instructions make sense. Because if the stack pointer always points to the last thing that you have already stored, we don't want to overwrite it, right? Because you know, that's already used, that location is already used. So the first thing we do is we decrement the stack pointer to point to a new location that has not been used before. And now that the stack pointer is pointing to a new location, we can now store whatever we want to store into that location. Is that okay so far? How we store something into the stack? Okay. So if this is how we store something into the stack, then how do we retrieve items from the stack? Well, it's exactly the opposite in many ways. It is exactly the opposite, not only in the sense that we will change decrement to an increment and we'll change the dereferencing you know, to the other side. You can see the order is also opposite. That makes sense because if the stack pointer always points to the last thing that you push on the stack, then to retrieve the last thing that you push on the stack is simply to use whatever the stack point is pointing to, dereference it, retrieve that value, and then put it into X, which is typically a register in assembly language programming. Is that okay? But once you have retrieved that particular item, that byte on the stack is no longer useful because you have just retrieved it. So what you do to deallocate to de that location is you simply increment the stack pointer to point past that location is now once again available. Is that okay? Do we have any questions about the concept of a stack and how the stack is implemented in C code? We are not converting into assembly code just yet, we're just looking at the C code. Yes, no, go ahead. Okay, so if you want to look at this as a diagram, um, I can try to show that here, okay? So I'm gonna use a new uh, document. Uh, eh, let's go ahead and save it. All right, so this is a new document and we'll go ahead. Okay, so the way I usually draw a stack is like this, so this is the this is stack as a as an array, okay? So when you just say stack, it is referring to the beginning of the entire thing. There are 32 bytes here, okay? In this example, okay? There, in this example, there are 32 bytes. This is pointing to the low memory address and this is pointing to high memory address. Is that okay? So the stack pointer, okay? If I go back to the slide, you will see the stack pointer is initialized as this, okay? I'm using pointer arithmetic here, which means, you know, I'm really just doing indexing or the address of, you know, stack in square bracket stack size. But we know that that element does not be, is not allocated to the stack. It is just one byte past the end of the entire stack. So this is how we initialize the stack pointer. Going back to the picture, it means the stack pointer is initialized to point here. Is that okay? 
So you might say, but this is a problem because you know, when we try to push something, when we try to store something, we're going to store into a location that does not belong to the stack. But that really is not a problem. Why is that not a problem? What is the first thing we do when we try to store something onto the stack? Decrement, exactly. So if this is the initial state of the stack, the first thing we do to store something is to move this pointer down to this location, which is one part of the entire stack, which is the, the, the quote unquote first location that I can use on the stack. I store here and then I move the stack point, then the stack pointer points here, which is the last item that I have stored. If I push again, then I will point here and this now becomes the next item that I have stored. When I retrieve items, I would retrieve the item here, which is exactly what the stack pointer points to. Then I increment the stack pointer so it points to the second last item that I have stored. So is that helping? Okay, very good. <clears throat> all right, so getting back to the notes here. So that's basically all I have to say about you know, how we push things onto the stack and how we retrieve items from the stack. And the stack point, the, the entire implementation of the stack is really just to say, this is a bunch of bytes and here's a pointer. And the way we use the pointers is either dereferencing it or we're incrementing it, or we're, de we're decrementing it. Is that okay? So now you have to ask yourself, what do we use as a stack pointer? Because the architecture has no SP, okay? None of the registers is, you know, is designated as SP or stack pointer. So that question is answered by, uh, we, we basically just, you know, uh, by convention, we choose register D as our stack pointer, okay? But when you look at the architecture, if you do not understand the convention or nobody mentions the convention to you, register D is not special in any way compared to the other registers. So if you look at registers A, B, C, and D, register D is not special in any way. It is only by convention that I choose to use register D as our stack pointer. So you might ask, so does that mean that you could have chosen one of the other three registers as a stack pointer? And the answer is yes. I could have chosen register A, register B, register C, or register D as my stack pointer. I just choose to use register D. Is that okay? But because it is the convention that I have chosen, you guys would also have to use register D as the stack pointer, okay? So if that is the case, then what do we do to call a subroutine, okay? We need to push the address on the stack. So instead of looking at the finished product here, <clears throat> I'm going to you know, change this to a notepad. So we'll basically look at the implementation of the program that we saw earlier, but in a step-by-step -step manner. You may not want to copy everything because I will keep changing things around a little bit um, because you know certain things don't work and so we have to change it Okay, so the program that we mentioned earlier is Basically function functionally. It is the same as this We call F twice We have a return zero in main and then we have you know void function F doing absolutely nothing now I did change the order okay F is declared later, you know defined later than earlier but that's okay because you know, in assembly language programming, the ordering of how you define something usually does not matter. But there's a reason why I do this. All right, so in assembly code, there's no end, okay, main, there's no, there are no curly braces, stuff like that. So we can comment out all of this stuff here. Okay. Um, but what we do to represent a subroutine in assembly is simply to name a label of the same name as the subroutine. This is how we implement the entry point of a subroutine. It's simply a label that marks, hey, this is the beginning of the subroutine, and that's it. <clears throat> so knowing that the entry point of you know, the subroutine F is just F the label, so going to F is not a problem, okay? In other words, a JMPI to F is going to it's going to continue execution in the subroutine F, which is you know, what we want to do. That's not a problem, easy peasy. The problem is how do we get back to main at the end of F? 
So you need some kind of a branch in JM in, in F, right? So you in this case you need a JMPI. So don't copy this, you know, because if you copy this, you know, you you need to make some changes to the code. So this is not the finished product. This is just you know thinking things out loud so that we can say, okay, so we need to go back to the second call. So we can say, you know, JMPI to second call of F. <clears throat> and that second call of F, you know, should be defined here, second call of F. And everything seems to be fine, right? I mean, this is, this is good. From main, I have a way to go to the subroutine F. And from the subroutine F, I have a way to go back to main to continue execution so that we'll be ready to call F again. Everything is good, except the second call is going to be problematic this time. There's no problem as far as you know, we are just thinking about how do we go from main again from F, okay? JMPIF, not a problem, easy peasy, right? But the problem is once you do this JMPI to F, the way F is going to return to main is fixed. It is always going back to second call of F, which is this label. So now we have this infinite loop going on because the, the way we go from a subroutine back to the caller is only dependent on a label, which is determined at assemble time. It is not determined at run time. Is that okay? So we have to change it, okay? We have to change it to a mechanism that will change based on runtime behavior and not just compile time analysis of the code, okay? And I'm pretty sure like uh, several of you guys are already thinking, so what does this have to do with the stack, right? You know, why do we talk about the stack first and then we talk about this? Well, the one thing you need to do is to say, well, before we go off to a subroutine in a call, maybe it's a good idea to remember where that call is supposed to return to. Does that make sense? It's kind of like you know, leaving behind you know, a, a breadcrumb so that when you're double backing, you can see, oh, okay, this is where I was. And then if, if the breadcrumb has a direction to it, you can even tell where am I supposed to go next. Exactly. Yep. That's what we want to do. So we want to say save return address, basically where to return to before the branch. And we're going to do the same thing over here. Save return address over here. So now the next question is where am I going to save the return address to? First idea, we'll use one of the registers. Well, that approach doesn't work too well, especially in the case of recursion. Because in the case of recursion, how many levels can you do recursion? Well, it kind of depends on the logic. It depends on what the parameters are, right? So there's no way to easily predict how deep a recursion can go, which means it can easily go beyond the number of registers that we have, and we have a problem. Is that making any sense? So we don't want to store into a register. Well, the only other thing we can store something is RAM. We can store something into RAM. But where in RAM? Okay, you can say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have one dedicated location for F to store the return address. When F returns, it's going to use that location as a return address. It will work if you don't have recursion. If you do not have recursion, you can have one single static location allocated to each subroutine so that that location is only used to tell the subroutine where to go back to when it's done, okay? But it, is, it has two problems. The first problem is it cannot handle recursion. The second problem is it is a static allocation. So let's just say that you have a gigantic program. It has got you know, like 60,000 functions, okay? Then you'll be using up 60,000 locations for the return address for all of these functions. The next question is, how many functions do you think will be active or being invoked at any particular point? Maybe 20 or 30. So you're wasting a lot of space because you're allocating 60,000 locations when you only needed like 30 locations. Does that make any sense? And it doesn't handle recursion. So that approach doesn't work, okay? 
So now you have to think about, oh, maybe we can use the stack. Maybe that's why Tech talked about the stack first. Does that make sense? That's why. That is exactly why we talked about the stack first. Okay. So we use the stack. So how do we save a return address? The return address is now represented by this label. So we just have to quote unquote push this label onto the stack. So let's go ahead and do this in C code first, and then we'll see how to translate that into assembly. So according to the C code, we need to decrement the stack pointer. And then uh, I know this is you know, not exactly C code, but it's close enough. And then we say whatever the stack pointer points to is going to get you know second call of F. Is that okay? So does that help remind you of you know the uh, the C code that we saw earlier? Okay, how we store something onto the stack. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now we need to look at this and go like, well, but how do we implement this in assembly? Well, we also know that you know, there's no stack pointer. There's only register D. So we are only decrementing register D. How do we decrement register D? That's a really stupid question, but I'm asking it anyway. Yep, we decrement D. How do we decrement D? Decrement D. <laughs> okay, so that fixed that problem. How do we store something to where register D is pointing to? Now, this becomes a little trickier problem because we do have ST instruction to store to whatever a register points to. And in this case, many people will be attempted to say, oh, we'll just say we store this number or this constant into that location. It has to be a register, exactly. So if you try to assemble this code here, you know, where the blinking uh, cursor is, the assembler won't like it. Okay? The assembler will complain and say, where's, where's register Y? Because you're supposed to use a register to specify what you want to store to in this case, where register D is pointing to in RAM. Okay. So now I have to ask you a few questions, which is kind of important. We are running out of time. Um, so we can continue from this point on, but I do want to ask you a question. Is why do we have this limitation? Is this a limitation because of the syntax of the assembler? Or is it because of the opcode? Or is it because of how the opcode is implemented in microcode? So you kind of have to think about those three things and see why they are related in the first place, and two, why this is not going to work. Okay, so I'm going to leave the question to you, um, and then we'll transition to the lab. We do have a new lab today um, regarding your stack operations. Even though we are not quite done with this part here, the lab does not require you know, to have this entire module finished. So the lab itself is part of the instruction, so don't try to rush through the lab, you know, read through because it is part of the instruction too. So I'll see you guys over at the lab in just